And so let's start and look at this from the beginning. And, and I think there's an indication of the, the spiritual state of Israel at the very beginning of this. Because when they come back from this great victory over Goliath, who is the ticker tape parade for? King Saul. King Saul. And, and, to, and to another extent also for who? For David. And so, so King Saul, it says they come out to meet Saul. And of course they, they applaud Saul. They give Saul credit. And then they give David even more credit. But who's not getting credit? God himself. And so I think really maybe a, a kind of an indication here of the spiritual state of Israel at this, at this point. And it is that when Goliath is killed, Israel gives praise to Saul and David, but they ignore God. There's no indication that God gets any credit here. Now, if we look back at the battle, we look back at everything that led up to battle. Did God get credit? David did, yeah, David gave him credit. He says, I, you're, I'm, I'm coming to you in, in the name of, of, of the Lord of Israel, who you defied. He, he definitely gives credit. Uh, but, but when we look at the, the response to that, and I'm not speaking of David here, I'm speaking of Israel. Israel seems to have quickly forgot that this, this was a miraculous work of, of the power of God. And they, they, at least in this account, we don't we'll get any picture of that. We don't see any indication that, that they see that or, or value that. And so, so with that then, probably part of the reason for that would relate to their king, to Saul. This is the guy that's been leading them. And since Saul's leading them, their, their inclination is to give glory to Saul and to give glory to David, to the people that, that God is using as the instruments of victory instead of God himself. And so, let's look at this with Saul. Let's look at the downward spiral. And the downward spiral of Saul begins with his pride. He begins with his pride. What's, where do we see the evidence that it begins with his pride? He was angry. He was angry when the credit was given to David. He was, he was angry when, when David got credit for more kills than he did. Even though that wasn't true, and, and so Saul's pride wouldn't allow him just to celebrate what David accomplished, let them embellish his record in that moment. He, he couldn't stand that. That, that, that shows this, this prideful spirit that, that, he, that he had at, at that point. And this is going to be what begins the process. So when that happens, he can't just say, oh, well, I guess, I guess this is what happens in, in military affairs he can't just let it slide. He, he's he's got to contest it. He's got to fight against it. And, it. and it begins this downward spiral that he, he, he has. Now, I would say this in our own life. When we, when we make some kind of foolish decision or, or, uh, uh, or, or an act that begins that process of, of taking us downhill, is that it usually begins with something what seems as somewhat innocuous, something that's not that big a deal. At least it appears that. But what does the Bible say about pride? It comes before the fall. And so, so he's a, this is an illustration of that. And so that one thing that we would look at and say, ah, that's not that big a deal. Any of us would get upset at that. But that's going to be that which becomes, turns this into a big, big problem for Saul. And so it begins in his life with, with pride. The next thing is that his pride leads him into envy. Now he's envious of what David is getting uh, credited for. Pride leads to envy in this way. Is that if, I, if, I, if, if, I'm, if it's all about me and somebody else begins to get credit, whether it's deserved or not, then, then I want that. I, I, that, I deserve that. I, I'm the one that should have got that. And so he doesn't want just glory for himself. He wants the glory that David's got. That's, that's envy. That's desiring what somebody else already possesses. And so he desires that. And so his pride leads him to envy, to want something that at this point belongs to somebody else. And so we can see this rolling along here, gathering steam. And so what happens next is Saul's envy leads him into bitterness. Now he's, he's bitter about what what has happened. And so in, in, in our own life, when, when these kind of things happen, 
we will almost always end up at this place of bitterness. When we get bitter, who is the target? Who becomes, who is responsible when we reach bitterness in our life? Who do we think is responsible, I should say? What did you say, Jesse? Okay, so, so bitterness in, in regards to David would be Saul's case. Do you, think, do you think that really, really describes it, though? Right. I, I, I think there is there's the, the sense that there's a face, the face of David in this, that it is an easy target, and he's obviously going to go after David. But when we get to bitterness, usually now, now we've, we've elevated this to God's fault. How, how could you let this happen? Why, why would you allow this to happen to me? After all I've done, I've been the faithful king of Israel for these years, fought in battles. God, why, why are you allowing this happen to happen to me? And so bitterness oftentimes is that moment when we begin to transfer our frustration from somebody towards God himself. Because God in some way is responsible for this. In that God holds all of us in his hand. And so if, if, if David here is getting the credit, in some way God has allowed that to happen. In fact, he would even say this, I can tell God is with him. He says that. Saul recognizes the presence of God in David's life, and yet he's still bitter. So in some way, his bitterness would be directed at God. So where does his bitterness lead? Well, Saul's bitterness then leads him into rage. He's raging now as he, as he paces around the, the, the palace here looking for something to do. Now, have you ever experienced rage? It's a good, it's a good example, Fred. Fred says road rage. Road rage. I, th- I think road rage is a good, is a good example. Road, road rage is, it, when, when we get that, I think there's something about being in that, the safety of the car and separated from somebody else where, where there isn't that direct confrontation with the other person that, that is a, just a breeding ground for rage. Where, where there isn't the threat of somebody screaming back at us and so we just rage at, at that person in the other car who's done us wrong. But now, now rage is, has come into his life, where he is, he is beginning to, to uh, have unbridled anger that is aimed at, at David in, in this situation. Now, is there any point in this, in this snowball that's happening here, is there any point where and let's let's remove the, the idea that God is sovereign and all and God is making all this happen. Let's just kind of kind of set that aside for a moment. Is there any point in this where Saul had the ability to 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 put his foot down and say, you know what, I, I I'm I'm not moving any further on this. I'm, I'm I'm not going to give in to rage, or once. Pride gave way. Was it a foregone conclusion? Did it have to happen that way? Harmful spirit. Yeah. 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 Well, well, I would I would say that introduced the possibility of Satan working, but but I still would say I, I still would say it didn't have to keep moving in that direction. Now, we know this, the kingdom's already lost, right? God has already said to him, the kingdom's lost. He's not going to regain his kingdom, for whatever he might do. But, but I, I do believe there's a chance to write a different ending to the story in, in, with, with Saul at this point. This is, this is Saul's unbridled anger that, that has taken over his life. And so I would say this, that, that any moment here... Any, each of these steps, if Saul would have turned away, would have said, you know what, I'm, I'm, not, going to, I'm not going to act on that 
He could have stopped this. But I find this too, that, that like the snowball going downhill, every time we, we take the next step, when we move, when we move from, from bitterness to rage, as we take, move into the next level of that disappointment, frustration, it becomes more and more difficult to turn it around. Would you agree with that? That it's, it's, it's easier to turn away pride and envy than it is to, to once you get to bitterness and rage. The, the further you go on, the, the more difficult it is. And when you enter, as he does, into this time of rage, it becomes really, really difficult to think that he's going to be able to get a hold of his senses and turn this around. But his bitterness leads him into rage. Richard Phillips said this. He said, Sin cherished in the heart will invariably express itself through the mouth and the hands. really like this. Not, not that I... I, I I, I like those words, but I agree with those words. That when, whenever we, whatever we cherish in our heart, that, that which we value, whether it's pride, success, whatever it, it, it is in this case with Saul, that eventually that which we cherish will actually, we will eventually, it will become that which we talk about, it will become that which we embrace, that, w- that which we do. And so we can't successfully harbor these illicit, immoral, wrong ideas and feelings and not think that at some point it's going to emerge from our life in the way that we act, in the way that we behave. And that, that's what's happening with, in, in the case of Saul. But, but before we get too critical of Saul, even though we can be very critical of Saul, we got to make sure that we turn this back on ourselves and, and, and evaluate that, that that which I cherish that which I really find valuable and I harbor in my heart will eventually emerge in my life in some way. For that reason, we need to be very careful with our, with, with our heart and with our, our passions in this case. And so what happens in this case then is this. That which he cherishes, that which he harbors, now is going to, that, that which he is, is, is allowed to uh, take over his heart and his life is now he's raging in this He's also now going to take action. Now is when he's going to start throwing swords. Now I think it's interesting that he describes him as attempting to pin him against the wall. That, that almost sounds like, well, I went through his jacket and, you know. But, but I don't think that's the case. I think he's trying to pin him to the wall by thrusting it through his chest. He's, he's trying to kill him, I think is pretty obvious. There wouldn't be really any value in just tacking him to the wall leaving him hanging there for a little while. He's attempting to kill him and takes a couple of shots at it. And so what happens then is Saul's rage leads him into irrational actions, things that he would have never thought in the beginning. Like we go back to the beginning and we look at pride and then we would go to the end of this and look where it ends up. If, if, it, if it was just here, we'd say, oh my goodness, how, how, did you, how did you get from there to there? And yet it is the natural progression when we entertain each of these steps and allow that to progress in our life. And so Saul gets to the point now where he is, he is acting irrationally. This is the guy who just took down Goliath. This is the guy that, that is a very successful commander in the army at this point. This is a guy who's very valuable to the kingdom. And all of those things should lead Saul to, okay, even though I'm, I'm, I'm a little envious of him, I, I, I can see that there's value in having him in the kingdom. And yet, he's going to act completely irrational. He's going to try to kill him. He's going to take out his life. And it's when we look at people who do things that, that are just simply unbelievable to us, irrational actions, whether we're talking about ourselves or somebody else, and we think, how in the world could that happen we, we, this, is the, this is the human condition. This is what we do when we entertain those things, that, that those, those sins and those, uh, those immoral inclinations in our life. And so Saul's rage leads him into irrational actions. And so where do his ir- irrational actions lead him to? 
it leads him to fear. Now he's afraid. And I want to challenge you in who he's afraid of and what he's afraid of. Saul's irrational actions lead him into fear. And I want to challenge you that he sees, it says, that he recognized that the Spirit of God was not on him anymore and the Spirit of God was on David. Saul understands that and recognizes that. And so what does he do after he has attempted to kill David? What's his next step? To, to get him away from me. To get him away from me. Now, I want to I challenge you that it's really not David that he's trying to get away from. He's trying to get away from God. And so, and so the only way I can get away from God is to get David away from me. And so if that, if that ends up in the death of David, awesome. That's, that's Saul, I think, Saul's perspective. But his fear is God. It's not David himself. It's God who is with David. And so, and so all I can do then in my fear is, is get him out of my presence. Now, I, I, want, I want you to think about this. When, when we start to behave, when we start to act in, in, in sinful, disobedient ways, who do we separate ourselves from as Christians? Yeah, other, other Christians, right? Or aren't we uncomfortable when we're around believers, when we're acting in sin and disobedience? That's certainly my case. I don't, I don't want to be around people in the church when I'm doing things that I know people in the church don't want me to do. We, we, we begin to separate ourselves from those people who, who we know are godly people. And I think it's a picture of what's happening here with, with Saul. I, I don't want to be around God and God is with David, so that means David can't be around me. And so he, he gets rid of him. And so his irrational actions against David eventually leading him into to fear. And then what happens next is that Saul's fear leads him away from God. Now, God has departed from Saul in the, the special sense that the Spirit of God rested in him as he first became king. That, that's already happened. But, but now he's got to a point where he doesn't even want to be around God. I, I don't want to be in the presence of God. Even though you look at David and say, David is a man that God is blessed and is working through, he doesn't want to even near him. And so he sends him away. And so Saul's fear leads him away from God. And I would say the same thing's true for us. When, when we get in this place where, where we are... are, are irrational, acting irrationally, we're engaging in things that we should not be engaged in, uh, eventually then our fear is going to remove us even farther from God. We don't, we don't even want to be in His presence. And it's why oftentimes we see that. We see when someone who's a part of the church begins to, to, to fall away in some manner, we begin to see them disappear from the church. We begin to, they don't really aren't that comfortable anymore in the church. And so kind of don't see him very frequently anymore. And so we, we, in our fear, are put in this position where we get away from the presence of God. What other ways do we avoid the presence of God? Stop praying. Stop praying. What else? Not reading the Bible. Not reading the Bible. The, those, those become the things that right away that we, we, it's, it's too uncomfortable to pick up the Word of God if the Word of God is going to confront me in my sin. And so I'm not even going to engage in that. I'm not going to talk to God about it because I know what God has to say to me about that. And so we completely avoid that in our, our fear. And so the question then comes back to this. Is it, was it possible... And, and, and I, again, I want to kind of... I mean, understanding this is, this is God's perfect, sovereign plan that's unfolding here. That, 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 that this is how God intended for this to, to, to pan out. But, but in this story of Saul, at what point could he have turned the ship around? At what point could he have, uh, you know, saved, saved himself some misery and fear and grief? Is, at what point could he have done that? I would say at any point, Fred, I, at any point in this, he could have 
stop this. Now, what would it have required? Coming back to God. Swallowing his pride, is that what you said? Yep. I, how, would you, how would you summarize that? What word would you use to summarize that? Well, everything. Repentance. repentance, exactly. Repentance, repentance that I'm going the wrong way. I've, I've got to turn around. I've got to turn around. And, and when I turn around from where I'm going, where am I turning to? To God. And, and I, I believe this. If we look at this story, this, this account of, of Saul and, his, and, and, and David, that I, that I believe that Saul could have, could have chosen a different path at any point. He could have not entertained the envy. He could have, he could have turned around at rage. He could have repented at, at the irrational actions that he was going At any point he could have done that, but he didn't. And, and I think that, that the lesson for us is, is, is twofold in that we understand this, we, that we are capable for, of almost anything. As, as sinful people, even as Christians, we, we are capable of almost anything that, that is dangled in front of us. And for that reason, we need to understand this, that once we begin to entertain that, the, the, the chance that what's going to happen next becomes more likely to happen, right? Each step that we take in that direction makes it more likely that we end up in the worst of places. And so with that, with that understanding then, we, we close with this thought. And it is that if we look at this from our, a human perspective, from our own heart's perspective, we see this. And it is that when we find ourselves in any of the previous steps, we must seek repentance and restoration. We, we need to turn around and turn to God and, and allow God to, to save us from the, the pain and the destruction that, that awaits us on, at the end of this. And, and, and Saul isn't going to do that. And that, he's going to become a, a, a horrible, sad story from Scripture of, of, of his lost kingdom. And maybe, like I said before, his, God had already indicated through Samuel that the kingdom was lost. He wasn't going to salvage the kingdom. But maybe he could have salvaged his, his life. Maybe he could have salvaged his, his pride and, and, and uh, been of some value to the work that the Lord would have maybe had for him to that, to that point. But I think it's really valuable for us not to just look and somebody like Saul, and, and, and see this just horrible guy and, and think that in some way he, he's an aberration. I, I could never fall into that. I could never be that bad because we're all capable of so much. And, and so when we look at this, recognizing that how important it is that we are tuned in to our proclivities, to our tendencies, to our the sinful habits and destructive thoughts that we might have so that we can, in fact, repent and be restored when we find ourselves heading in that direction.